This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you for joining us. With me today is my co-host Richard Fields and friend of the show, John Cameron. Richard, I want to talk to you today about the precautionary principle as a driving force behind this whole coronavirus response and other mass government responses. You had wanted to talk to me about it, so let's, uh, what do you have to say about that? Well, the, the precautionary principle is essentially take no risk, no matter what the trade-offs are concerned. If there's any risk at all, don't do it until you can prove the negative, prove that it won't harm anything, which, of course, proving a negative logically is impossible, totally impossible to do. The precautionary principle basically states you have to prove a negative. You have to prove that whatever you propose to do uh, will cause no uh, harm, whether it's environmental harm, uh, harm to health, harm to, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, the precautionary principle has been used for a myriad of uh, environmental climate change laws and so forth. Now it's being used in the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. It's being used in this way. Uh, Fossey and the other uh, uh, people who are medical doctors or who are epidemiologists, people who uh, you know, are looking at the coronavirus issue from just one perspective, that perspective being we must not let anybody at all die, uh, if, if at all possible, from the coronavirus. They're saying we need to save lives. If we save one life, that's that's okay. No matter what we do to save one life, it's fine. What they're neglecting to do, because they're following a precautionary principle, is they're saying there can be no trade-offs. Uh, if uh, you know a dozen people, if we save one life, but a dozen people die because of uh, starvation, because of the of the uh, lockdown, that's okay because we're not taking trade-offs into consideration. We're only looking at one issue. One issue being coronavirus deaths, and the precautionary principle says that if we don't lock down, somebody else is going to die. That's that's the, the, the gist of it. Yeah, and the fact that maybe somebody who has, say, mental health issues being isolated will commit suicide when he wouldn't have otherwise doesn't get considered. because no, that, yeah, the domestic violence, uh, suicide, uh, people not being able to get uh, needed operations because the hospitals are basically shut down for anything other than coronavirus. All of these things are, are you know, uh, are costs to the economic shutdown that we're experiencing that are not considered. They're, the only thing that's being considered is, will one more person die of this virus? Yeah, and the human cost of the virus, which is quite real and true, which we all want to concern ourselves about, but they're not really concerning themselves with the human costs of the consequences of those decisions. It's just, this is the decision and this is all we're going to think about. And the consequences of that are, we're just going to kind of ignore and hope they don't exist. I yeah. And then, and then after the fact, when it comes to light, we'll say, well, that we also, but we saved all these lives, which number will be inflated. We'll say, you know, they'll say we saved, you know, thousands of lives from the coronavirus. Who knows? You can't prove that either. Yeah. Because yeah. a certain amount of people are, you know, Death is a natural part of life, and viruses are a natural part of life. There is a certain level of that which we accept, otherwise we couldn't function as a society or as human beings. John can probably talk about how the precautionary principle has fed into the whole climate change argument as well, right, John? Yeah, I, I, I could. Uh, let me beat that dead horse a little bit. Um, so the you know the same thing with the with and, and actually that's actually where it started. The, I guess the Germans came up with the idea in the 80s, and it was all about environmentalism, protecting the planet. And uh, they actually, I guess, the EU has it written into law uh, when it comes to environmental issues, and it led to the Kyoto Protocol and all the rest of that stuff. Which is, you know, we've got to stop doing all these things because it could affect the future in a certain way. The, the problem is, is with that could is, you know, I mean, the aliens could land and, and give us the magic power button tomorrow. And that doesn't take into account, you know, um, but the, the problem with the, the could is that it's, it's all based upon models. And, and uh, even if you take when you go back to environmentalism, if we did everything that the greens, the, the really radical greens want us to do, basically took ourselves off of carbon um, now, 
it would still have not the effect they want on their model of uh, projected temperature gains, which is simply a model. So it's, it's not about an outcome uh, anymore. It's just, it's basically the relig religion of ecology. But I want to, I want to back up to um, the, the, uh, the costs that, that are real that they're talking about. You're, you're having a whole generation of, if we're concerned about the lower echelon of society, single family homes, um, you're, you're talking about the, the uh, mental health and all the rest of that, you can put some numbers on it. And, and we know from, from <coughs> studies uh, done over hundreds of years that the, the greatest uh, benefit to health uh, for the human population is economic well-being. The richer the country is, the better off the people are, the more healthy they are, the longer they live, and all the rest of that. And we can take it back to uh, the environmental world, where the richer the country is, the more they can afford to actually take care of environmental issues. You saw it in Japan, you know, and Japan got rich enough, it went from a filthy industrial country to one of the cleanest places in the planet, uh, but they could only do that when they had the money that was was created from all these horrible factories where they made crap and then they made good stuff. So the, the economic uh, fallout from from kids not being taught and, taught and kids not – is that me? Feedback? I'm hearing feedback. But anyway, uh, kids not, not getting the, the meals that they were getting. Basically, a lot of these kids are only getting fed in schools, and now they're not in schools they don't have any way to learn. So it's the that the the principle you're talking about kind of originated in the environmental movement and then became a matter of law. But the problem is they don't make any adjustments. That principle, the way it's the way it was promulgated, said that that uh, as evidence opens up and, and you see what's actually happening, because you make you put the stake in the ground based upon uncertainty, what could happen. Then as the future reveals itself, you're supposed to adjust the behaviors that you're doing. But the problem with once government does something, they don't adjust anything. They just <clears throat> write it in stone. Anyway, I'm, I'm rambling on here. I want to I want to get onto the other subjects as well. Yeah, just one final note. Uh, we would not be driving cars. We would not be flying airplanes. We would not be uh, using uh, life-saving medicines, most of modern progress would not exist had the precautionary principle been in place back in the uh, 19th and 20th centuries. Mm -hmm. We couldn't even ride a bicycle if the... No. Uh, you, might fall, you might fall down, and you can't prove that you won't. Yeah. But speaking of struggling with fl not flying and driving cars, uh, Venezuela is struggling with fuel shortages. You were talking someone who's sitting on top of the large one of the world's largest reservations reserves of oil is running out of fuel. I mean, how is that happening? I think John, I think this is something you wanted to discuss. Well, yeah, I I, uh, I thought the uh, I asked you guys to take a look at that that little BBC clip, and I thought it was rather poignant. And uh, it's it's poignant, especially in relation to what we're doing here, and that's why I did it. That centralized planning. Uh, and having government uh, uh, try to do things simply doesn't work. Uh, one size fits all is being tried with this coronavirus thing. One size fits all never works, you know, because towns are different, cities are different, everything else. But centralized planning, um, letting people who are in government make, make major decisions about lives leads to Venezuela, which is why I can't understand why this country um, – uh, you know, why so many people are in, play, in, in favor of socialism because it hasn't worked anywhere it's ever been tried. Even the, the role model countries uh, in like, you know, Norway, Finland, Sweden, all the rest of that, they had to back off their socialist models. And the, the, uh, the, the uh, ones that have huge oil reserves like, you know, Finland and other places that huge wealth funds can only do it because they have a tiny population and a bunch of, of uh, natural resources. So if, if you took... I think it's Finland that has the trillion dollar. Norway, Norway. Norway. Norway's got the trillion dollar wealth fund. Well, if Venezuela would have operated their oil reserves the way uh, Norway does, they would be sitting on a $20 trillion wealth fund. 
But what they decided to do was was have centralized government planning, and uh, it's led to rampant inflation. The 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 uh, the clip that hopefully we all watch showed a surgeon waiting in line for 13 hours to get gas so he could go to the clinic to operate on someone, and. Uh, and at they showed pictures of, of the clinic he was working in with you know broken in windows and and uh, uh, no radiology equipment for cancer and all the rest of that. Well, you know, thankfully, what the the, the hospitals in the states or at least in California are now doing because they shut down all quote unquote elective surgeries. Um, and elective is a is a very you know uh, wishy washy term, but uh, I guess they the people in charge didn't realize that they make all the revenue from the quote unquote uh, um, elective surgeries. So now they're uh, flipping the switch and they're going to go back to operating 24 seven on uh, knees, hips and corneas and all the other things that actually make them some money. But the, the, the reason I, I wanted to focus on Venezuela is, is a country that was well-educated. Um, people were, were um, well-educated, hardworking had a high standard of living and then when, when centralized planning took over, even though they were sitting on the biggest tub of oil on the planet, they now have people starving, they have uh, shortages, they have hyperinflation, not hyper yet, but they have near runaway inflation. They have people waiting in line to buy gasoline uh, so that they can drive yeah. themselves to a hospital that's broken down to try to save somebody's life. And yeah, I just, another part of that clip was uh, a school teacher trying to get by on a dollar and twenty cents per month, and I would call that hyperinflation. Yeah, uh, it, based on that, kind of, right, it is hyperinflation. Yeah. This is a country that has uh, has a really good infrastructure, or had, yeah. uh, and and what the uh, socialists and you have to call them socialists because they are professed socialists. Uh, you know, from the you know, Hugo Chavez and Maduro, all of them are. Uh, you know, died in the wool socialists supported by Bernie Sanders and that, you know, that ilk. What they did is they said, we can uh, handle the refineries better than Chevron and Texaco and Exxon and, you know, the people who were actually in there and knew what the heck they were doing. So they kicked out the people who knew how to run a refinery, ran them out of town, ran them out of the country. And of course, the refineries broke down. They don't know what to do with, uh, with them. And that's why they have a gasoline shortage. They can't They've got the oil, but they can't refine it because they've run off all the expertise. Socialists who, who have, you know, a, a degree in Marxism, Leninism doesn't teach you how to run a refinery or anything else useful. Doesn't teach you how to run a washing machine. So, you know, I mean, much less a refinery. And it is high sulfur oil. So it does, it's, you know, there's some, there's some oil coming out of the ground in, in uh, Saudi Arabia that's almost clean enough to put in a diesel truck without really touching it much. I mean, you got to tweak it some. It's it's called clean diesel, or actually it's it's not diesel. But anyway, it requires very little refinement. The the uh, the oil in Venezuela is high sulfur oil, and it requires some work. But there's so much of it, and it's so easy to get out of the ground that it could still be if, if for example, if some of those smart re, uh, rednecks in, in Texas were running the place, uh, people would be you know, I think I think gasoline at one time there was almost virtually free, uh, not because people knew what they were doing, and and these people don't, and and that's the kind of thing we want to pursue in in this country, and those kind of inefficiencies are being shown by um, by politicians even in in this country, rather than when this pandemic started, and I call it a panic demic rather than pandemic, because I think the underlying uh, the underlying disease is is not all that bad, but the cure is going to kill us all. The government stepped in, Newsom's boys and girls stepped in and did something that they're not good at, which is acquiring uh, supplies through a supply chain they weren't un, they weren't familiar with, and negotiating for goods and services. And all this stuff is coming to light. How horrible they how horrible they are at that. And and that basically, if you look at the, uh, what's happening in, in Venezuela, it's that compounded to the nth degree. Every every step where you had people who are experts in their fields, experts at operating, experts at creating, experts at managing, experts at leading and hiring, were shoved out of the way and you put uh, people who didn't know what they're doing in charge 
now you have those lines. So I'm, I'm done with that rant and ready for the next one. Well, we get political. I think the problem is we get political implications, political decisions start being made instead of economic decisions. Right. And mm -hmm. so, yes. instead of, and so people, instead of we, Hey, we have to make our oil refinery, make enough oil to sell so we can have some money from externally. They try to keep all their oil and all their gas internally. And of course the whole thing falls apart and then maintenance can't be done. And then the people who actually can buy the maintenance don't know where to buy the parts from. I was a supply. I worked as a, a purchasing manager for a while. And if you lose a supply chain, if for whatever reason, you have to go start trying to find these parts from somewhere else. It's a nightmare. And if you don't know how to do that already, if you're a bureaucrat and you don't know how to do that, you're lost. You're completely lost. But Steve, speaking of completely lost, um, the minimum wage in California is still slated to go up despite of the unemployment crisis. I think, you know, I think we've kind of made a decision that we don't care about the economic consequences of political decisions. I, I just don't actually understand why they haven't pulled back on something like this. Well, th this is economics 101. And what's happened is the law of supply and demand has been arbitrarily repealed by uh, Newsom and the uh, Democratic state legislature. They have decided that uh, supply and demand don't determine price anymore. They determine price. And of course, what that will do every time in every place has ever been tried, whenever you try to fix prices, uh, the in, in this case, fixing prices too high, the, uh, the the demand will go down. The demand for labor is going down. Unemployment is going will go up even more than it would go up as a result of all of the the layoffs from the uh, as John puts it the panic epidemic, uh, as well as the uh, problems caused by businesses just going out of business because uh, they can't afford to stay in business. Add to that the fact that uh, those people who uh, don't make or make approximately the minimum wage, they make more on, on unemployment insurance uh, than they do on, on the minimum wage. So it's, it, you know, the whole, the whole system is just, is just messed up and it's going to result in making the economic depression. And we're not talking recession anymore. We're talking depression. It'll make the, the economic depression deeper and longer than it needs to be. I want to, I want to speak to that because I, I, uh, I write from coffee houses. That's that's the fun thing that I do, and so I understand the economics of uh, of uh, businesses that that hire people at or near the minimum wage. And every time the minimum wage goes up, you you um, what they end up doing is cutting staff because they can't pass uh, in a competitive world where where you know Starbucks has to compete with. Uh, mom and pop chains or, or, or single proprietor uh, locations, you can't suddenly raise uh, your price of coffee arbitrarily, the price of, of the croissant you might sell with it. You can't, um, you know, tack on the, the, uh, the, the, you can't add an upcharge for condiments or all the rest of that, especially in the, in the high tax state that we're in here with sales tax being taxed on everywhere else and the cost of regulation. Uh, even in something as simple as a coffee house where, where you just have people grinding coffee and putting it, not just, it's a skill, you know, to make good coffee, it's a skill. I've had some very bad coffee. So uh, watched every time the minimum wage goes up, these people tighten their belts. They end off laying, uh, they end up laying off somebody, which is really their only, the only place they can go. And so, now we're in a position where, where all of those small businesses are already shut down. They can only, they're trying to survive on 25% of the revenue they had. And if, only if they have another business driving some revenue, cash cow, uh, you know, someplace that's doing a lot of to-go business, can they even survive to get to the point where they can open their doors again? And, and now the bureaucrats have decided when they open their doors, they're instead of going to fill their tables at you know 70 percent, which they need to make their nut, or 60 percent, or whatever it is, they're going to have to do with 25 or 30 percent of the tables they normally would. So it's really just again back to that centralized planning kind of thing. It uh, you know I think uh, where where did caveat emptor come and let the bar be where if you want to go sit down somewhere and have a meal, take the risk. If you don't want to sit down and somewhere and have a meal, don't take the risk. You know, and if, if you're worried about 
contamination, all the rest of that. Wear your mask in between bites. I don't know. Wash your hands twice. But having some, you know, some some bureaucrat decide, and and I don't even think they're deciding based upon scientific data from the so-called experts who have all been wrong. I mean, or does anybody aware on the on the panel of uh, whether or not they're actually making these recommendations based upon what the quote unquote experts are saying, or are they just pulling out of their? Well, yeah. Well, they started making you know recommendations based on experts, but it became very clear early on on the part of Democratic don't let a crisis go to waste Democrats, that this would be an extremely easy way to turn the strong economy that is the only hope of a Trump re-election into a very weak economy. Mm -hmm. I will make a prediction. I will make a prediction that as of uh, election day in November, most of the, after the election and after Trump loses, most of the restrictions will be miraculously lifted and nobody will die as a result of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and counter your prediction. I think uh, the early early elections around the place are showing that uh, that uh, people who are already railing against uh, all of this control stuff are deciding that uh, Democrats don't deserve to be in office. I think uh, Trump's gonna win a second term. Who knows? I think we should bet. We should do a heavy bet since. In that, in that case, case, in that case, the uh, the coronavirus crisis will last for another four years. Yeah. <laughs> well, the one thing I've learned is is to not try to predict uh, politics in this time frame. It's a mess. Yeah, it's I think it's a <laughs> point. yeah but I, I yeah. understand the reason. Goodbye, Justin Amash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a whole nother can of worms. That's the whole why Justin Amash decided to leave instead of yeah. decide to run. I didn't even put that one on the list. I don't even think we want to mess with that today. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know it's, it's weird all of the all of the uh, big voices in the quote-unquote libertarian world came out and eviscerated him right when he right when he started running for you know this kind of you're not a libertarian what are you saying you know yeah, you we've only got like six minutes left within, yeah, whether it's within the libertarian party or the democratic party or the republican party this is politics it ain't beanball yeah. 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 Well, my problem with the politics is we have a group of people who aren't serious about playing politics. They want our party to be a philosophical group and not a political group. We're politics. We have, we want to play politics. We have to play the game of politics. And there's a group of us, a loud group of us who doesn't want to play the game. They want to play their ideology. And I love their ideology because it for those of us who do play the game of politics, it gives us a North Star so we don't get lost in the weeds, gives us some place, hey, where are we? Okay, that direction, right? Hmm. But when it comes to actually electoral politics, just talking to voters, they're not helpful. No. And so, there's, you know, there's that, uh, there's a balance there that we have to strike and we don't even seem to try. So that's kind of my... I'm just trying to make myself shorter here. There you go. <laughs> that's going to be a problem, John. No, actually, I'm... The shortest one in the bunch, and for some reason on my screen, I'm the tallest. It's just not right. I'm trying well, to address that. I don't want people who see me, you know, on the street after our, our huge audience that we have that's watching the show, the tens of thousands that watch the show, as you know, think that I'm actually taller than Richard Fields. That, that, that's not possible. Yeah, there you go. Anyway. No. Oh, All yeah. Right. All right. So I, you wanted to, to get something before we're done. You wanted to say something, James. Oh, yeah, but we've got a five minutes, and there's a growing spread of civil unrest. I think we want, you know, I've got a couple other topics here, but I actually wanted to talk about this growing civil unrest. I caught a clip the other day about uh, some uh, cops came into South Central Los Angeles. Uh, I guess it's a housing project, and they tried to tell these kids to, you know, stop playing. Uh, they were playing water pistols and throwing water balloons at each other, and they tried to, cops tried to come in and tell these kids to stop and, you know, go social distancing. And the kids turned on the cops and soaked them with the water guns, the pistols, the, you know, all this water balloons, the whole nine yards, and essentially chased the cops out of there. Mm -hmm. and, you know, but we're actually seeing a growing list of this. We've got militias showing up in front of barber shops, preventing barbers from getting arrested and salon owners and bar owners. There's a growing civil unrest kind of fermenting from the bottom up. And I thought maybe you guys talk about that a little bit. Well, the only thing that prevents uh, a tyranny is the people refusing to be tyrannized. If 100% of the population said no to the would-be tyrant, the would-be tyrant would be impotent. The problem comes when 80% of the population says to the would-be tyrant, I'm not going to put my neck on the line. I'm going to you know, kind of ignore 
uh, all of the uh, nonsense that's going on and kowtow. And if 80% of the population or some neighbor, you know, somewhere in the in that neighborhood uh, kowtows, the tyrant wins. The only way the tyrant loses is if everybody or, you know, a vast majority of people say, no, I ain't going to do that. Well, I'm, I'm seeing, I agree with you. I'm seeing, uh, I haven't read the, the, the B blurb about uh, uh, Newsom changing his standards, but it looks like he's, you know, the, his counties no longer have to have uh, a, a no deaths in the last 14 days and some other things. They just have to have capacity to take care of people when they get sick. So I think what, what he's doing is loosening the, the tyrant's reins in front of the revolution rather than trying to hold on to the reins and being run over because, uh, you know, people are, are just going to just aren't going to put up with this. I've talked to one whole person whose cousin might be very ill, a young person, uh, not, a, not a person with comorbidities, but a young college student who came back from New York. There's no confirmation yet. Uh, that uh, that she does indeed have COVID-19. Um, and and the only people that are getting sick and dying are as healthcare workers who weren't aware of the virus at the beginning or people with a bunch of comorbidities and people are looking at lost jobs and everything, and they're just not going to put up with it. They, see, they don't see any evidence in their neighborhood. Maybe they do in New York. Maybe they do in L.A., but um, certainly not here. I mean, we have in, in Sacramento County, you're in Yolo County and, and you have what, like no COVID-19 and no deaths or very little, Richard? And and here, yeah, I, was, I was talking to my doctor. I live in Yolo County, talking to my doctor, also in Davis. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's sitting in the doctor's office. I was getting a small procedure done. And he uh, looked at me in his mask while I was sitting there in my mask. And he said, you know, it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you're talking to each other wearing masks. This is insane. Uh, my business is down. You know, this is uh, Sutter. Uh, Sutter has lost $1 billion in the first quarter. I've taken a 20% pay cut. Uh, hospitals empty. Uh, the doctor's offices are empty because everybody's afraid to go to the doctor. Everybody's afraid to go to the hospital. We're, we're prohibited from doing, uh, you know, elective surgeries, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, the, the healthcare system is in a mess, uh, a self induced mess, or a government induced mess, because of the corona panic. Hmm. Panic-demic, panic-demic, new word. Yeah, It'll well, be a dictionary well, next year if we all start using it, panic-demic. Uh, well, and that's about all the time we have. I do like to say I've seen some police officers and some police of chief, uh, chief of police come up recently and say that the state has been asking them to do some unenforceable laws, and so they've just, we're not going to do it, and I think that has been nice. But we are out of time. I'd like to thank Richard and John for showing up and, and having this discussion with us today. For more information about the topics, I will have it up on our website, libertariancounterpoint.com. There we go. If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit all the appropriate buttons. We greatly appreciate it. You can find us on all your normal and favorite social media platforms. And from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, thank you for watching. And please remember to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week.